As I've said in a few of our episodes, the year 2001 was a pretty momentous turning point for the world of video games. It was the proper start for a new generation of consoles, and alongside that upgrade came a changing in the zeitgeist of the video game industry. The word zeitgeist is thrown around a lot without being properly defined. It's a German word meaning roughly the spirit of the times. A catch-all term to try and sum up the general feeling and sentiments at a moment in history. On any given day in 2001, it would be difficult to feel this kind of change in sentiment, but looking back over the year as a whole, it will be quite hard to miss. Nintendo had revived the home console market in the late 1980s and proven it was an enormous business with a hefty financial reward. Sega had come in through the early 1990s to prove that other players could get in on that action, and then Sony joined the fray in the late 1990s and surpassed both in elevating the market and the medium to a new height of mainstream acceptance and financial success. While all this went on, the ecosystem of American video game talent that had been all but decimated in the crash of the early 1980s either retreated into the world of personal computer gaming, like their European brethren, or started over from scratch, now under the market domination and trend-setting tutelage of their Japanese competitors. By the mid to late 1990s, both those sides of the industry had grown tremendously alongside the growth of the industry itself. PC gaming had become more and more accessible, streamlined to users, and featured games not seen on consoles, both in form and in content. While American studios that started to get into the console space were given repeated legs up as Sega and then Sony courted them to try and take down their competitors and woo Western audiences away from other systems. By 2001, the confluence of these parallel trends overturned the established order set in the late 1980s and set a new baseline for what gaming would be and what gamers expected from the industry going forward. The tastes and desires of Western audiences were in the ascendance. Specifically, those Western gamers that had grown up alongside the industry since the late 1980s and were now the first fully inculcated generation of console gamers to reach adulthood and prime market value with their disposable income too. Long form adventures with detailed storylines were in and quick pick up and play arcade games were out. Colorful and cartoonish characters and settings were out and realistic real world grittiness was in. First-person shooters were quickly rising as a dominant genre, while platformers were starting to fade away. And a culture that had been growing more and more atomized within each person's private sphere was being introduced to gaming via the internet, which allowed consumers to continue bowling alone, but together. This in no way is to say that one form of games entirely removed the other from existence. Mature titles aimed at Western audiences were now simply in the driver's seat, and those games that might fit into the Blue Skies category were now just along for the ride. One was the sun, the other was the moon. Nothing demonstrated this more in 2001 than seeing Sega leave the console market and Microsoft step in. Sega had been there right alongside Nintendo in the mid to late 1980s in reviving the North American console market, albeit with much less initial success but they had been a fixture in the industry for those 15 years since in the post-crash video game world. The foundation of their seat at the table was their overwhelming dominance in the arcade market, making arcade-style quarter-grabbing, technology-pushing games. But all that had essentially withered away by this point, with the Western arcade markets virtually gone by the beginning of the 21st century, and the Japanese arcade scene in a state of perpetual decline. Meanwhile, Microsoft had only started paying attention to video games about five or six years earlier at the launch of its world-dominating operating system, and now it suddenly thrust itself into the console market in order to keep the console market from subverting their own attempts to Trojan horse their way into the world's living rooms. The naive early years of games as an isolated business onto itself was coming to an end. While the perpetual mantra of game makers, that is, the developers themselves, was to give them a simple system, an easy system, but a powerful system to work with, and their creativity will be unleashed, resulting in great software that would have customers come flocking to your system. The PlayStation 2 came along and flipped that on its head. 
Out of all four of its competitors, from the Dreamcast, to the GameCube, to the Xbox, the PlayStation 2 was widely regarded as the most difficult piece of hardware to work with in order to get equal or superior performance. Its design was bespoke, very specific, and yet still left everything in the hands of the programmers and did very little for them automatically. Yet, it was the product that got the waves and waves of support from game makers and flew off the shelves virtually from the minute it was even announced, long before it had any major titles that justified its purchase beyond habitual early adopters. Part of this is the consumer loyalty and momentum behind the PlayStation brand itself. But every prior market leader had failed to pass the baton to its successor, so it couldn't only be that. The ace in the hole for Sony would be that DVD player, an advantage only they could really bring to the table due to their role outside the gaming industry as a behemoth in the field of consumer electronics. If your game console was going to come with a free DVD player, it would take an awful lot of value on the other side of the ledger to steer someone's purchase away from it. The competition would have to offer some other killer feature exceeding the value to you of having a DVD player. The primary way people would watch movies in the 2000s, and the replacement for the ubiquitous VCR. Nintendo would bet on the strength of their own brand and the quality of their games, plus sweetening the deal with a lower price for its hardware so you could put some of that difference towards your own DVD player. While Sega and Microsoft bet heavily on the coming wave of online gaming to offset Sony's advantage. All of them would fail in their gambles, and no one would need to wait till the end of this console cycle to find that out. It was already written on the wall right here in 2001. Sega had already thrown in the towel in the very beginning of the year in an effort to stave off bankruptcy, while Sony had already blown away the Dreamcast's user base by selling over 10 million PS2 systems by the end of the year 2000. By the end of 2001, Nintendo and Microsoft were both racing neck and neck to sell through hundreds of thousands of units, while Sony was sitting pretty with over 20 million PlayStation 2s sold worldwide. And that massive install base meant no game studio could afford to avoid that market for their game. Sony had flipped the script. The idea of making a system had been that if you do it right, if it's powerful, flexible, and easy to work with, it will attract games that will make it sell. In other words, the old adage that, if you build it, they will come. Instead, Sony had made the console independently valuable before software even existed and games had to come to them. They inverted the old saying into becoming, if they come, you will have to build it. Even the biggest, richest company on the planet couldn't come in and beat that advantage, no matter how many billions of dollars it burned. Another lesson of history that comes to mind here is the idea that leaders are always preparing to fight the last war, not the next one. This is where we pivot to Nintendo. For while Sega and Microsoft had made bets on where the next war would be fought and simply been wrong, Nintendo was the general preparing to fight the last war, but do it right this time. After seeing the technical limitations of their cartridge format and the difficulty in working with the Nintendo 64 as the stumbling blocks keeping the world from buying into the majesty of playing Ocarina of Time and Super Mario 64, Nintendo had bet that if they rectified these things and played a strong game in the price war, they could come out on top on the strength of their software alone. They weren't quiet or shy about this. When they showed up to E3 2001 to unveil what they had for the GameCube, their slogan for the show was, The Nintendo Difference. And Satoru Iwata would expound on that again and again. What it boiled down to was that Nintendo was different. They were exceptional. Their games were in a tier no other companies were. It was certainly a bold proclamation. Some might even have called it arrogant. Another ancient phrase that comes to mind is that pride goeth before a fall. Still, all the big picture market realities are one thing. What did all of this mean for gamers? What was Nintendo up to in 2001? At the beginning of the year, Nintendo was just trying to keep the Nintendo 64 alive a little bit longer, at least until E3 apparently. Its last holiday season had been carried over the finish line thanks largely to a new Zelda title, Majora's Mask, the continuing strength of the Pokemon franchise with Pokemon Stadium and Heyu Pikachu, as well as some technical marvels from Factor 5, like Star Wars Battle for Naboo and Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. Heading into 2001, the Nintendo 64's arsenal was almost empty, 
with just a few send-off titles getting finished up. This would include Paper Mario, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Pokemon Stadium 2, and Mario Party 3. But after this point, in May of 2001, that was all she wrote as far as the Nintendo 64 was concerned. It wasn't a surprise for the Nintendo 64 would be winding down. Nintendo had already shown the world what it had up its sleeve for 2001 back at Space World in August. The interesting thing was that Nintendo was preparing to replace not just its aging home console, but also its far more popular handheld system as well. For the first time, Nintendo was getting its two product lines in sync as 2001 would feature the launch of both the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube. And with Nintendo talking up the possibilities of connecting the two platforms, this seemed pretty deliberate. It was an important step toward Nintendo trying to leverage the one asset it had at its disposal to counter Sony and Microsoft, its absolute ownership of the handheld gaming space. There appeared to be some strategic thinking going on that they might be able to create a halo effect from its popular Game Boy line to drive purchases of its home console. The first steps have been taken to test this out with the Nintendo 64 Transfer Pack, allowing for some connectivity between certain games like Mario Tennis and Pokemon titles. It was a bit of a long shot, but it seemed to be the card Nintendo was most interested in playing. Phase 1 of that plan seemed to get off to a strong start, as the Game Boy Advance launched in Japan in March and Western markets in June and quickly flew off shelves, with a massive stack of launch games, although the bulk of these were from third parties, that Nintendo themselves only contributed the beefed up NES and Super Nintendo games in the form of Super Mario Advance and F-Zero Maximum Velocity. In the handheld market, Nintendo had its own version of If They Come, You Will Have to Build It, since there was no other game in town anymore and handheld gaming was still a huge market in the age before smartphones took a big old bite out of it. But in the absence of any new software for the Nintendo 64, the Game Boy Advance would take up the bulk of Nintendo's attention and marketing. Of course, as we've mentioned in possibly every single episode so far, E3 2001 was the big bang as far as GameCube games were concerned. But as we also noticed and covered, the deck seemed to be pretty heavily stacked with games from Nintendo and stable of partner companies. Third parties were relegated to pumping out quick and easy cross-platform ports from games on the PS2 and the Xbox, or in Sega's case, from its arcade cabinets and the Dreamcast. The late finalization and slow rollout of GameCube development kits seemed to be at fault, as only the VIP studios outside Nintendo's orbit, like Sega and EA, were getting kits even by the Christmas of 2000, giving them less than a year, giving everyone else mere months to bang out projects before the 2001 holiday season. Nintendo's effort to make sure its system was everything a developer could want certainly came in handy here and spared them from possible disaster when it came to third-party game support, since many of these quick projects would be able to be easily brought over to the GameCube. And since it was a noticeable step up in power from the PS2, where most of these titles originated, it managed to run them without breaking a sweat. Although, like we saw with SSX Tricky, it was still up to the developer to put in the effort to polish up the port, and Nintendo's choice to go with smaller DVD formats and smaller memory cards meant some things had to be compressed or cut, like we saw with Madden in All-Star Baseball. Plus, there was no sign that Nintendo had any interest in online gaming, which gave the PS2 version of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 a major advantage over the otherwise very well-polished GameCube version. This is where Nintendo's narrow vision of what was necessary to make for the ultimate TV gaming machine appeared to fall short, since hard drives, DVDs and modems can certainly all be used to broaden the possibilities for what games can do and be, even though that might not necessarily be the primary reason their competitors put them in there. Still, the process of bringing a game over to the GameCube was reportedly very quick, cheap, and easy. So why not? Well, like we saw with The Simpsons Road Rage, the audience that bought GameCubes seemed to be remarkably disinterested in what third parties brought to the system at least compared to owners of the other systems. At least they didn't seem to be there for these quick ports. Non-Nintendo games made specifically for the GameCube, like Rogue Squadron 2 and Super Monkey Ball, did quite well in the sales charts. Nintendo's focus on making its games the reason that gamers bought its system appeared to be having its intended effect in a careful-what-you-wish-for sort of way, since these gamers appeared to be purchasing the GameCube only for Nintendo's games. While this might financially suit Nintendo in the short run, if it wanted to grow its user base and wrest any semblance of control over the market from Sony or Microsoft, it needed to tend more than just its own little garden. 
before the end of 2001, it made one big move that showed it might be serious about courting third parties onto the GameCube and trying to bless their titles with a Nintendo effect. It announced a deal with Capcom to bring all its mainline Resident Evil games exclusively to the GameCube, with Shigeru Miyamoto himself reportedly doing the rounds as the ambassador to court the company into Nintendo's fold. It had also found some natural allies with two of Sega's Wayward Studios, as Amusement Visions had done very well with Super Monkey Ball, and Sonic Team gladly jumped into the Nintendo Club, announcing Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the GameCube. Nintendo was going to need this and much more if it was going to try and compete to win this round of the console race. As the year 2001 came to an end, and the GameCube had gone on sale in both Japan and North America, it sold through 2.4 million consoles to consumers across both these markets, according to Nintendo's sell-through numbers in early January. Of that 2.4 million, 1.3 of them were in North America, where Microsoft had also launched just days before, and reported selling 1.5 million by the end of 2001. It was obviously close, but it looked like Microsoft had beaten them by a hair, relegating them to third place in the world's largest market. Nintendo still had the worldwide advantage over its new competitor, since the Xbox hadn't launched anywhere besides North America yet, but it didn't bode well for the fight to come. We'll see how that ongoing console war shapes up as we continue into 2002. We'll also see how well those third parties that did bet on Nintendo managed to do with their GameCube projects. We'll see if the end of the development kit shortage brings new and better games made exclusively for the system. What exactly Nintendo's plans to do with that modem and broadband adapter it said it would release are. What this Game Boy Advance connectivity would do. And if Nintendo's trusty mainline franchises could pick the system up and restore some of its former prestige and leadership. We'll see all of this unfold as we continue to cover the little purple console on this show we call Cron Cube.